Thank you very much, comrades, and it's a great honor for me to be with AS, and he's from the revolutionary uh, left current in Syria. It's one of these things, you know, um, when, whenever I was in Lebanon, uh, I always used to travel to the Bekaa Valley. People might know the Bekaa Valley. It's, it's really good for food. That's a place I love to go to. Um, but in the middle of the Bekaa Valley, there is a statue of a man called Hafez al-Assad, who was a peasant dictator's father, and he was a tormentor of Lebanon. And I remember I'd, I'd be driving with friends and so on, I'd see the statue and I'd say to myself, one day the statue is going to come down. And I'd say, but I won't tell anyone because they'll think I'm completely an utter idiot. And as soon as I met Faiz, I realized that not only did I think so, but there were tens of thousands of others who also thought the same thing. And that this, uh, the, uh, the outbreak of the Arab Revolution is that point where everything that we know is in our heads, suddenly everybody gets up and says exactly the same thing. We're sick of this, we're sick of what's happening. But of course, the thing about revolutions is they're extraordinarily difficult things. Very, very difficult. All kinds of forces are thrown into it, and they're never done in other conditions in which are suitable for us. And there's nothing uh, that's, that fits us more than the Syrian revolution itself. And if we take our minds back to the outbreak first of the Tunisian revolution, then it spread to Egypt, and then after Egypt, it went into uh, Libya, it was uh, appearing something in Bahrain, and I remember thinking, Really, deep down, I'm very worried about Syria. Because you can have revolutions that get rid of pro-US dictators, and they're really uncomplicated. Actually, we know the revolutions in Tunisia and Egypt are much more complicated than that. But they're really, in, in terms of imperialism, relatively uncomplicated for people. But what happens if you have a revolution inside of a uh, regime that is formally anti-imperialist? And this is what happened in Syria. And I think it's important we understand that there's many people who, who support the regime, who simply say that this is a conspiracy from the outside and so on. And the way that this conspiracy works, and I've heard it many times, and you know, to be honest with you, it's amazing that people take it seriously, but it is, it is a serious thing, that somehow the CIA uh, hoodwinked the people of Daraa in the south where the revolution started to uh, launch a revolution in order to forward the interests of Saudi Arabia and the US. As if this is the reason why people go unarmed into the street to face down a dictatorial regime. This isn't it at all. The revolution itself has its own history, emerged out of the conditions of Syria itself, and it faces tremendous complications. And the biggest danger to the revolution, apart from the regime, this is a very, very big danger, is the way in, in which the sharks have very, very quickly begun to circle around. And we know who these sharks are. It's imperialism, it's the reactionary Arab regimes, it's the way the Israelis are now looking into Syria, the way they looked into Lebanon in 1976, 1977, all the way to 82. Can they exploit this revolution? Can they work on the weaknesses of this revolution in order to, uh, uh, in order to get a foothold back into Syria? And so for the people in Syria, when they made their uprising, they were facing not simply the regime itself, and it's a very, very nasty regime, but also those threatening to not only hijack the revolution, but also to, uh, to, to destroy the revolution. They face many, many enemies. And there is a saying in Syria, we have no friend but God. And I think people should understand the sentiment. That is, that they feel, even though there are all kinds of forces attempting to influence the, the, the revolution, they feel they have no friends at all. They have no friends at all. And they rely completely on themselves. There is a, 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 a better thing that I think describes the Syrian revolution. It was one uh, a, a phrase that was coined by someone who was actually against the revolution. He said, um, the thing about the Syrian revolution, you have to understand, there's only two groups of people who support it. One are the Salafis and the other are the Trotskyites. Actually, it's, it's a bit more than that. There's also the Arab people generally understand uh, the support for the Syrian revolution. But it faces incredible difficulties. Incredible difficulties. Because it was a revolution that emerged really with very few leaders, or very few leaders that were trusted. These were the conditions under which people in Syria lived. It was such a heavy dictatorship, such an uh, uh, overwhelming dictatorship, that there were very little few spaces for people to emerge in the same way they emerged in Tunisia, and the way our, the revolutionary forces began to emerge in Egypt. So when it began, it began with very little. And, the, uh, uh, and, it was, and when it spread, it spread really uh, 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 on a kind of make-do basis. So when the first uh, uprising, well, the first real demonstration began in Dara in the south, um, and the army came in and opened fire on the demonstrations, then other neighborhoods further in the north came out in support of the people in Dara. Then they were attacked by the army, and other neighborhoods in other cities came out. So as it spread, people came out to protest the, 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 the crackdowns, the sweeps, and so on, on various cities. And this then began to ripple through Syrian society, but it didn't do so in the same way as it did in Egypt or it did in 
Tunisia. There was no general strikes at the beginning of the revolution, unfortunately. General strikes happened later, but they were almost too late to influence events. So people really began with very, very little. And that meant that they were open to all kinds of exploitation. I remember meeting some very nice, very nice Syrians, actually, on a personal level, of much respect to them, when I was invited to do a meeting in Poland. And we were chatting away, and I said, well, you know, which tradition are you from? And they said, we're Ba'athists. I said, oh, that's interesting. So, you know, <laughs> Ba'athists against the regime, and how am I going to take this? Yes, 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 we were part of that section of the Ba'ath party that was overthrown by Hafs al-Assad, you know, back in 1970. And for us, it's the Ba'athist revenge against the Ba'athists. And you're thinking, okay, now who in Syria thinks this way? Probably no one. Because you had, if you like, this exile leadership that was able then to present itself as a leadership of the revolution. You see, constantly from the ground inside the revolution, people were going, who are these people, these revolutionaries, they call them hotel revolutionaries, who hang around the conferences and so on, uh, when we are the ones who are making the revolution on the ground. It was this uh, difference, if you like, that, that there was no leadership emerging directly out of the revolution that allowed these outside forces to begin to influence it. And when the, uh, the Syrian National uh, Congress appeared, um, it was an exile thing. And they went immediately to the Americans, immediately to the West, and this drew suspicion on the revolutionaries themselves. And they were able to then, the supporters of the regime were able then to point to it and go, uh, 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 this is an outside plot, and so on. But we have to understand that it was the weakness, I think, inside the revolution that allowed these people to come. And it's also something that is changing fundamentally uh, very, very quickly. So we make a revolution. You make a revolution, and the circumstances are extraordinarily difficult. And you make a revolution, which I think, I am surprised, is still going on. But whenever you meet Syrians, and every year people coming back from Syria, they talk about the liberated zones and the way people experiment with democracy and so on. And this deep belief at the end that what they're doing is about independent Syria and not about handing one, their, their country from one dictatorship to the other. But there are severe dangers. There are severe dangers in the way in which the West is trying to exploit this revolution. And we have to do two things, and I think it's not difficult to do, which is that we support the uprising of the people, and we understand why these people are desperate for weapons that to be faced with, you know, helicopter gunships and heavy tanks and everything. You're desperate anyone to give you weapons because, you know, I don't know people you might know this, might, know, not, might not know this, there's no such thing as a weapons fairy. Really, when you're in these situations, you're desperate for anyone to give you weapons. This is a weakness that they allow to exploit. So these conditions do exist. So we have to be against imperialism, what imperialism is trying to do inside of Syria, but also understand the Syrians themselves know this as well. And I have a colleague who now works for Time magazine who travels around a lot of the liberated zones. And I was asking her about you know, the way in which, uh, the, way in which the, the weapons works. And she said, well, it's relatively simple. You know, a local commander of the Free Army or you know, the rebel brigades goes to a Qatari sheikh or something and says, anything you want, give me some weapons, anything you want, we'll follow your plan. And they go, OK, you know, you'll be Muslim brother. Yeah, absolutely, everything you want, now give us the weapons. They then go to the Saudis and say, anything you want. You, you, you know, you would say, oh, we want you to be pro-Saudi. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, now give us weapons. And the thing about this is it is from a point of weakness. And I think we have to understand that. So we have to do that. We have to understand that there's a revolution process taking place, and we support this revolution process. But we also have to understand, in, especially in the West, that we do not allow our ruling classes to exploit this and to hold the revolution hostage or attempt to hijack the revolution. I think these two things uh, are, are, are the same. And I want to make, I have two minutes, I want to make one more point. It was one that actually really struck me the other day. For many years, we, uh, when we talked about Palestine, we put Palestine in this formula. It said this, how can we liberate Palestine? It says, well, we can only liberate Palestine if we have revolutions in the Arab world. Great, everybody agrees. Only liberate Palestine says revolutions in the Arab world. Suddenly, now there's revolutions in the Arab world, they're saying, no, no, you mustn't have revolutions in the Arab world until we get rid of Israel. So, what can you do? So either you have a revolution in which uh, you can liberate Palestine, but as soon as you make that revolution, you're told you can't have that revolution just in case the Israelis and the Americans may take advantage of it. And we have to reject this completely. We have to understand the revolution is a process. We have to understand that each of these revolutions are linked to each other. So we support the Syrian revolution and the independence of the Syrian revolution being, being very, very important. But also we, we work really hard to ensure our ruling classes don't try and act, to be honest with you, like a bunch of loan sharks to people who are desperate. I think it's really important that we can do the, we can do, uh, the, the same things. Thank you very much. Um, I would really like to welcome um, Gerd Knight-Pays, uh, who is a revolutionary left current from Syria. Um, Gerd will speak for about 20, 25 minutes, um, but will also be translated by Anne. Thank you.
كثير من الجميع آه آه اليوم آه آه يطفو الاضراب عشرات من المعتقلات السوريات في السجن الدكتاتورية يوم آه اليوم الثالث عشر Today, um, the strike by, which is a, a strike by political prisoners, uh, women political women. women political prisoners in the in the jails in Syria, is entering its 13th day. غدًا هناك نشاط تضامني مع هؤلاء العشرات من المعتقلات في سجن عدرا في قرب دمشق. أتمنى من الحاضرين بشكل أو بآخر أن يشاركوا في هذه. Um, and tomorrow there will be a day of action and protest and solidarity with these dozens of women prisoners who are currently being held in a prison near Damascus. كنا نقول على أن سوريا الثورة الشعبية في سوريا قدمت عشرات من الروزات. روزة. This indicates that women have played a central role in the Syrian in the Syrian Syrian revolution so far. That we say actually and we say in in Syria that the Syrian revolution has produced dozens of roses. Rosa Luxemburg. هل تريدون أسماء ريم؟ روزا حسن ناهد بدوية ريم فلاح حان وغيرهم من الروزات المكافحات والمناضلات والقائدات الثوريات. Have we heard of the names of these of these women women prisoners Reem and Rosa and so on? ناهد سؤال. ولكن هناك خصوصية للثورة السورية. أثار الضغط في وسط اليسار العالمي. البعض يقول أنها ثورة إسلامية، أنها نزاع طائفي، أنها مؤامرة إمبريالية. لا يكفينا نظام متوحش ودموي. علينا أيضا أن نقنع بعض الرفاق في اليسار العالمي أنهم أعمياء. Um, an Islamic revolution that it's uh, it has a sectarian basis. Some people are saying that it's a conspiracy by imperialism, and that we have to we have to convince people uh, who are blind to see what the revolution really is. سأعطيكم فقط حصيلة على ما يفعله هذا النظام الذي يعتبره البعض علمانيا مقاوما ونهضا للإمبريالية واشتراكيا عند البعض. Um, we also have a, a, a job to challenge the ideas that the regime itself, which is a brutal regime, is a secular regime, that it's resisting imperialism, um, and that it's doing any of these, and it, that it's some kind of socialist regime. Today in Syria there are more than 100,000 martyrs. And a quarter of a million who have been imprisoned. ونفس الرقم من الجرحى. Same number of it of injured. وأكثر من سبع ملايين مهجر أو نازح من السكان. Seven million people displaced refugees. مليون ونصف بيت مهدم بشكل كامل أو جزء. Hundred or one point five million people whose homes have been partially or totally destroyed. هذا النظام الوحشي يمارس حربا حقيقية. ضد شعبه لم نشاهدها في مكان اخر غير في الحروب العالميه ربما الثانيه والاولى. This brutal regime has really carried out a war against its own people that we have not seen in other places. هذا النظام ليس لا علميا ولا مقاوما ولا اشتراكيا وساثبت لكم ذلك. And so we have to say clearly that this is not a secular regime or a regime of resistance nor is it any kind of socialist regime. قبل أن تقوم الثورة في عام 2010 كان الوضع العام في سوريا الاقتصادي هو التالي. In 2010, before the revolution, the economic situation in in Syria. أولاً كيف يتوزع الإجمالي الناتج المحلي؟ 
هناك ثمانية في المية للعمل وثمانية في المية لرأس المال. One of the questions was how to uh, distribute the uh, wealth. Created in Syria locally, local production. Um, eight, seventy-two percent of the. Um, seventy-two percent of the people in the regime are from the business class. ولكن 60% من هذه 72% هي لرامي مخلوف وشركائه وهو وهو ابن عم الرئيس. And 60% of the uh, people it's people like Rami Makhlouf who is the um, the nephew of the president who owns something like 60% of the uh, capital in the state. عندما جاء بشار الاسد وورث الحكم عن أبي مهزلة عام 2000 كان عدد الفقراء في سوريا بمعنى من يعيش تحت اقل من دولار 11000 بالمئه من السكان. When Bashar al-Assad inherited the rule of Syria from his father, the level of poverty in Syria was 11% of the population were poor. ولكنه هو في اقل من 10 سنوات حسب احصائيات الامم المتحده تحول 33% من سكان سوريا تحت خط الفقر بمعنى اقل من دولار في اليوم. In less than 10 in less than 10 years the number of the percentage of the population living in the below the official poverty line which is less than a dollar a day had risen to 30% of the population. إذا أضفنا أن خط الفقر يعتبر فقيرا من يعيش باقل من دولارين فنصف سكان سوريا اصبحوا فقراء بسياسات النيوليبراليه لبشار الاسد. And if we took the poverty line to be two two dollars a day, then the majority of the Syrian population, thanks to the neoliberal policies of Bashar al-Assad, are living in living in poverty. ورغم غياب الحياه السياسيه والنقابيه الحره في سوريا نتيجة هذه الدكتاتوريه منذ اكثر من 40 عاما لكن الطبقات الشعبيه والعمال عبرت باحتجاجات واضرابات على هذه السياسات منذ عام 2006 رغم ان لم تاخذ هذا الاهتمام في وسائل الاعلام مقارنه ببلدان اخرى. And although for, because we had 40 years of dictatorship, uh, it was, there was no kind of free life or politics or in the trade unions. The uh, ordinary people in Syria did take part in social protests and strikes, protesting at these neoliberal policies from around uh, 2006 onwards. وكانت بعض هذه الاضرابات العمالية حتى عنيفة بمعنى النظام تعامل معها بعنف شديد. And some of these strikes by workers, for example, were repressed brutally by the regime. ونحن كنا نرى أن كل عوامل الانتفاض والثورة مهيئة في بلدنا كغير من البلدان المنتظرة. Uh, and we saw we saw that just as in other countries in the region, uh, people were beginning to, to 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 draw revolutionary conclusions from uh, their everyday lives. وملك المغرب من مساجد خلال ال 20 عام الماضي. This is not a secular regime either. Um, the, the regime built 12,000 mosques, um, which, is more, which is more than were, than were built in, in Saudi uh, and other countries in the region. ونرى اليوم أن المؤسسة الرسمية الدينية لكل الأديان إن كانت مسيحية ولا إسلامية ولا شيعية ولا علوية ولا سنية هي جزء من النظام وتؤيده حتى هذه اللحظة في سوريا. And until this, until this time today, the principal religious institutions of every religion, whether they're Christian or Shi'i, Sunni, uh, Alawi, or, or other, other religious groups in Syria, they're part of the regime. وعن حمايته بالأقليات في الواقع هو لا يحمي الأقليات ويستخدم كل الشطارات 
العموديه في المجتمع السوري وغير المجتمع السوري للحفاظ على استمراره كما فعل في لبنان عام 76 دخل الى لبنان سحق الحركه الوطنيه الفلسطينيه عام 76 وتحالف مع الكتائب اليمين اللبناني ومن ثم عاد مره اخرى ليسحق الكتائب يتصرف دائما بتحالفات مؤقته بما يسمح ببقائه And the idea that this regime protects minorities is completely false. Um, this is not something that we've seen in, in Syria. All that the regime is interested in is protecting its own, its own rules, so it's attacked minorities. And when it's come to foreign intervention outside of Syria, you only have to look at the situation of the Syrian intervention in the Lebanese um, civil war in the 1970s when the Syrian regime attacked the Palestinian movement and the national movement in, uh, in Lebanon and allied itself with the Hezbollah Qatar, the Falangist um, ex extreme uh, Christian party which slaughtered Palestinians um, and made these temporary alliances with whoever would, would benefit its, aim, it, 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 its aims in order to stay in power. And now, في درعا وانتشرت على صعيد الوطن وكانت في البداية مظاهرات سلمية وجماهيرية واسعة أذكر فقط على أن المظاهرات التي حصلت في مدينة حمل لوحدها في تموز 2011 كانت تضم 500 ألف مواطن لتضامن. And the revolution that we saw began in 2011 in the town of Dera, but then spread throughout the country. It began with peaceful demonstrations. Um, and as we saw in the town of Hama in uh, uh, July 2011, to 50,000 people taking to the streets uh, in solidarity with the revolution. لم يكن هناك حسبا سياسيا أعطاها الرشيطة والوصفة كيف عليها أن تفعل. And from the beginning, the masses who've been involved in this revolution process have made their own forms of organisation, um, despite not having political parties or, or political organisation uh, of their own. وهي ما أصبح معروفا الآن هو تنسيقيات تنسيقيات الثورية. And one of the examples that's been quite well known, become quite well known, is the coordinating, the revolutionary coordinating committees. هذه التنسيقيات تقود العمل الميداني في الأحياء وفي القرى وتنسق بينها وبين بعضها البعض. So these committees run daily life basically in the uh, in the neighbourhoods, in the villages, and they coordinate between uh, between. لا لا يوجد بلد آخر في المنطقة تطورت في هذه الظاهرة. معنى كيف تنظم الجماهير نفسها من الاسفل بهذا العمق كما هو عليه في الثوره السوريه. And we haven't seen actually in any other country um, this degree of self organization from below or such depth in terms of uh, of organization expressing the fact that this is a revolution being made by the people from below. في نفس الوقت شكلوا ايضا اشكال حكمه من ذاته. وما يطلق عليه المجالس المحلية والمدنية تدير الحياة اليومية للجماهير والناس في المناطق المحررة وحتى في المناطق التي ما زالت تحت سيطرة النظام. And we, they've also made forms of local self-government uh, in areas that have been liberated and even areas that haven't been liberated. كما قلت البارحة كنا نتوجه نحن كيساريين ثوريين إلى الجماهير نتكلم عن السوفيتات والمجالس لم تكن تفهم علينا. As I mentioned in my talk yesterday, us, we in the revolution we left, of course we talked to the masses about um, the idea of Soviets and uh, workers, workers' councils and so on, and people didn't understand us at first. أصبح جزء اليوم من الممارسة والخبرة للجماهير ممكن أن نقول لهم نريد الآن مجالس العمال والكادحين سيفهموها عاشوها ويعيشوها كل يوم. But now the situation is different because people can see from their own daily lives and their own experience what we mean when we talk about workers, uh, workers councils or ordinary people organizing lives, their lives for themselves. وعي الناس والجماهير يتغير في محاولتها ونظرها لتغيير الواقع والمجتمع التي هي فيه. وهذه حقيقة في الفلسفة الماركسية والنظرية الماركسية تثبت الآن ونراها. People's consciousness is changing in the course of the struggle, 
Um, this is a, a, an enormous confirmation of something that is been long argued within Marxist theory. هل كان اليسار موجودا في الثورة والتنسيقيات؟ نعم، ومنذ البداية. Was the left present in the coordinated committees and in the revolution from the beginning? Yes, we were. النظام قتل اختار أو قتل تحت التعذيب ثلاثة أجيال من القادة الميدانيين للتنسيقيات. The regime killed either directly or in uh, uh, killed killed people under torture three generations of people from the uh, uh, from the coordinating committees. نتيجة العنف الشديد للنظام وقتله المجاني والواسع للجماهير لجأ جزء من الجماهير نفسها إلى حمل السلاح دفاعا عن نفسه. The level of violence from the regime and the brutal nature of the repression has also been a bridge towards people, ordinary people seeing that they need to arm themselves to defend themselves. And so for us, this is part of the people protecting themselves with the, the armed people protecting themselves. This is... Um, for us, this is the idea of the people, a popular armed resistance. It's not about it being called the Free Syrian Army or, or, or other kind of labels. Um, are there jihadi and uh, other Islamist organizations that attack people for being apparently non-Muslims and so on in Syria? Yes, they are there. We, وأنها تشكل جزء من الثورة المضادة ليس بالنسبة لنا نحن كيسارين حتى بالنسبة للجماهير الشعبية السورية. And from our point of view, they're the part of the counter revolution, and that's actually not just our view on the left, but it's also the view of the ordinary people in Syria. عدد هؤلاء المجموعات من الجهاديين لا تتجاوز في أحسن الأحصائيات والتقارير عشرة آلاف مقاتل. لكن المقاومة الشعبية المسلحة هي أكثر من مئة ألف مقاتل في سوريا. And if you look at some of the best figures that are around, saying how many of these jihadi fighters are there, it's around ten thousand that is usually quoted. But actually, there are a hundred thousand people involved in the popular armed resistance. لو كنتم تتابعون الأخبار في سوريا، لكنتم عرفتم أنه منذ أشهر تخرج مظاهرات ليس فقط ضد النظام. ولكن أيضا ضد هذه المجموعات الإسلامية التكفيرية. And so we don't just see demonstrations going out against uh, the regime in Syria now. We also see people coming out and protesting against these jihadi organizations. وإن المقاومة الشعبية المسلحة <coughs> تواجه أن اقتضى الأمر بالسلاح هذه المجموعات. And people are starting actually to resist these jihadi groups um, with, the, with weapons, with arms. في سوريا لا يوجد حرب أهلية ولا نزاع طائفي. In Syria, we're not talking about a civil war or a sectarian war. إن ثورة شعبية أصيلة وحقيقية. It's that we're talking about a popular revolution. توجد تواجه نظام دكتاتوري دموي وعني. Which is facing a dictator, a dictatorship, a bloody dictatorship, and a violent dictatorship. ومكونات القوى. ثورة مضادة من هذه المجموعات التكفيرية. And there are uh, organizations that are part of the counter revolution, these jihadi, these jihadi groups. وليس هناك نزاع طائفي. And there isn't a sectarian regime. ما يلعب في الطائفية هو النظام نفسه فقط. It doesn't, it doesn't just play on sectarianism uh, alone. لو كان هناك نزاع طائفي أي رفاق. لرأيتم دماء العلويين والمسيحيين وغيرهم أنهارا في سوريا. ولكن هذا النظام وأيضا وسائل الإعلام وبالذات السعودية وغيرها من هذه القوى الرجية تريد بأي شكل أن تتوقف الثورة أو العملية الثورية في منطقة في منطقتنا عند سوريا، وهنا الأهمية الجيوستراتيجية للثورة السورية، وهنا مأساتها في نفس الوقت، لأنها ثورة يتيمة في الواقع. But 
the regime and the media want to destroy the revolution. They want to they they want they want to stop it and stop it from from spreading. They want it to be an orphaned revolution. سأرد أن الوقت انتهى. سأقول نحن على تسليح المقاومة الشعبية. I want to say it's the time is finished that we are with the idea of arming the popular. بدون أي شروط سياسية كائنة المكان. Without any conditions on that on that arm on the arms going to the popular resistance. نحن مخرطين بكفاح جماهير الشعبية السورية حتى النهاية من أجل انتصارها مهما كانت التحديات وشكرا لكم. And we are with the the people of Syria, the popular revolution in Syria, to the end until it achieves victory. Thank you. Uh, I'm from South Yemen, um, revolution that not really up um, um, like the, the Egyptian revolution and, and the Syrian. But uh, there is, <clears throat> I'm, I'm from South, from Aden. I went um, in March and there's ongoing uh, revolution. I wrote a few articles in the Social Review if you want to read. But what I'm, I'm trying to say here is you know, there's few comrades from different parts of the European. I think there's a need for us to meet up and to see how we can help to spread because in a then yeah there is there is a hunger for idea people really desperate for it there's the old communist party who joined uh, after uh, ali's uh, departure they, they joined the government and they, they there is no comfort there's no there is no solution they have to date the, so there is a hunger for ideas there is a hunger for, for a socialist idea which is we experience it in in the south of yemen because we had something and we lost it throughout the, the last 20 years so the idea is still fresh so i wonder if, if you know probably we as the, the socialist worker party can probably meet together and, and see how we can help spreading the revolution across the arab world or across the, the whole world actually because i think we're lucky here in the uk because we've got established party that we need to hold them to and try to, to encourage more people to join in and spread it nationally and internationally and um, uh, urge my, my, my comrades in, in the UK to meet up probably soon and try to discuss how we can work together to um, to have the, the Arab um, you know, revolutionary there. Um, thank you. I heard the speaker start in saying that uh, there are 10,000 10, thousands of Rosa Luxemburg strikes springing in Syria. And being also a member of the Spartacist League, I find this really amazing and uh, like prettifying what's going on there and debasing our entire heritage. In fact, there is no revolution in Syria. There is a civil war between two equally reactionary camps. <laughs> and uh, uh, on one side, the Assad regime. Tell that to on the other Tell side, on the other side, you have a bunch of uh, Sunni, Sunni sectarian forces, Islamists, and pro-imperialist students. We have seen the same in Libya, where you supported the Benghazi opposition and called the Cameron government to give the safe assets of Gaddafi to them. So that's the same history we are seeing. And the workers have no side in this uh, bloodletting. If the imperialists intervene, they should side against the imperialists with the forces in Syria, although we never supported the Assad regime. And uh, you do support this, uh, the side of the so-called rebels. In fact, it's the same side that is supported by the imperialists. You are standing with the Saudi Arabian and the other people, and you are standing with the Islamists there. In fact, there is no, this is not a new thing. Throughout the so-called Arab Revolution and in all the history, the SWP has supported so-called anti-imperialist Islamists, starting in Iran, where you had the so-called the coming into power of Khomeini, to Afghanistan, where you had the Mujahideen freedom fighters against the Soviet Union, because you had the side in common against the former and the generated work state. And this is not revolutionary politics; it's a reactionary. <laughs> Okay, I'm part also, I'm a member of the Revolutionary Left Current in Syria, and uh, I have a blog that is called yeah. Syria. First of all, I would like not, I'm not disagreeing at all with Simon, but to remind him that the first demonstration that went on in Syria was in support of the Libyan, Egyptian, and Tunisian revolution that was. Uh, repressed by the Syrian so-called anti-imperialist regime. So this is just a reminder for the people that tell this regime is anti-imperialist. It has crushed popular protests in favor 
of other revolution going on in the, the region. This is the first thing. And after, as a revolutionary, the worst solution in Syria is that this regime stays. And this must be our first message to the world, as and people in support of the Syrian revolution, that the worst solution is that this regime stays. And this is the plan of imperialism, this is the plan of the Geneva Conference that has been tried since the beginning of the revolution. If you heard the talk yesterday of Comrade Dayas, the plan of the Israeli was even to keep Hezbollah, Ba'ath, the Ba'ath party, to keep the same regime. For a regime that has served imperialism for 30 years, since Hafez al-Assad arrived to power. And this is something we have to remember. The popular movement. The popular movement in Syria has been alive and more than alive for more than two years. And now we have so-called revolution coming up to think, to teach revolution. People in Syria have taught you revolution. <laughs> The regime, they have opposed the opportunist bourgeois opposition represented by the Syrian National Council that is supported by the West that want to deal, want to do a deal with the regime. They have opposed them. They have opposed Jabhat and Nusra. And just a reminder, who think, who believe that you can crush sectarianism in the regime without crushing this kind of regime that uses sectarianism to divide the people just as the bourgeois regimes in Europe uses racism to divide the people, just as they use Islamophobia to divide the people. Yeah. Uh, just to <laughs> Who was welcome in Damascus, recruited the head of the Islamophobic <laughs> British party. And as we speak about progressive, this, this popular movement had opposed the Islamists that you condemn before that you stand up here. They have opposed them in the streets because of the reason, because of the authoritarianism. You don't teach them, they teach you. Yeah. And they have been teaching you for more than two years. And you have, and you have understand it more than anyone in Syria that our faith is linked with the people of the region. This is why we have stand, and not the Syrian regime, with the resistance wherever it was, in Palestine, in Lebanon, in Jordan, where as the Syrian regime stand in against. We stand in with the Iranian people when they raised against the Islamic Republic. This, this is the Syrian people. They teach you. Viva the Syrian revolution. Only two questions. Uh... What's the role of Qatar and Saudi Arabia in the situation? And the second is, what's the role of the fighting between Shia and Sunna? Maybe it's are the same question, but that's my question. Followed by Judith Hi, uh, John SWP. Um, I'm just hoping the um, speakers could clarify the role of Hezbollah in Syria. Before, followed by Mark uh, Goodcap. Yeah, I think we got a little taste of some of the arguments that go on the left in here. And I think the first thing to say is I think those who are dismissing the Syrian revolution in those terms, to me, it just I quite agree with Joseph, it reeks of Islamophobia. The idea really is that, you know, the movement of the revolution. Uh, and we heard similar in the previous meeting, so I just think that it's easy for people sitting safe and smug in London to decide they know better than people who are facing literally a life and death struggle to change the world. I really, revolutionaries in this room and the SWP have no truck with that sort of nonsense and we are have fought long and hard here very big arguments about the Syrian revolution on the left in Britain and within the Stop the War movement because we have been told from the beginning that really the Syrian revolution isn't a real revolution. It's actually a tool of imperialism, a vehicle for the imperialists and not a genuine popular revolution. What we're hearing today and what we heard yesterday is really the kernel that is what drove people, what drove the kids out initially to put the graffiti on the walls. This is part of the Arab revolutions. Now, of course, the imperialists are trying to use it because they have been pushed back in the region. They lost their big allies, Ben Ali, Mubarak, they went down, they lost their key allies. They've had to reassert themselves, they've had to reorient themselves. They've had to, from backing the, the, the regimes, the dictators, and let's remember, they still back some dictators. 
you know, they're all for popular revolt and democracy they claim in Syria, but when it comes to Bahrain, when it comes to Saudi Arabia, they're on the sides of the dictators. So don't believe their lies when they say they want to help the popular revolt and get democracy, because they pick and choose. What they're trying to do is reassert control in a region that is strategically very important for the West, and they want to use the revolution for that. So we're not naive about what the imperialists want to do. But at the same time, we can see that at the heart of this revolution is a struggle for something absolutely different. You see, because when you start denouncing the revolution as merely an imperialist tool, you see, really what it is is saying that Assad is in some way a progressive leader. Now, if some people deny that's what they're saying, but actually the Stalinist notion that you can have progressive states and therefore anybody who opposes that progressive state is in some way a counter-revolutionary or a reactionary. It, it, that's exactly where this argument is coming from. And we, that's not part of our tradition. Our tradition is saying, where is democracy? Where are the real anti-imperialist forces? They are the people who are fighting on the ground. And what we can do in Britain, far from standing around and telling our comrades in Syria what they should be doing, we should be fighting to make sure that our ruling class keeps its hands off. We want to be saying to our ruling class, they don't need your help, they don't want to create this intervention, and it will never be humanitarian, it's never for a popular vote, imperialist out and the revolution. Yeah, um, I mean, like Simon said in his introduction, it's, you know, in a way surprising just the determination and dynamism of the masses to keep going in the face of what they have um, experienced. And it's something that continues to, um, you know, inspire, I think, people around the world. Um, and I'm really glad I now know the person who runs the blog, which I often refer to and often send stuff to against all those leftists in Australia, particularly, who who have illusions that Assad is some kind of you know, anti-imperialist figure. So that's fantastic put a, to put a name to a blog. Um, but uh, I guess I wanted to ask, I, in yesterday's talk that Anne gave about you know, the social roots of the Arab Spring, she talked about the crucial junctures in revolution where the um, political and the social um, come together. And in some ways, we sort of, in comparison, she made the point that, you know, and, and others have made it as well, that there haven't been the mass you know, strikes, there hasn't been a mahala and all the rest. But I think, um, as our Syrian comrades said, that obviously the, the neoliberalism, neoliberalism that Bashar al-Assad implemented means that there is definitely an economic um, basis to it. Unfortunately, the Western media has largely um, ignored that as the conflict has become increasingly militarised. But a couple of other quick um, questions. Assad's you know, obviously an evil dictator, but he's not an idiot. Um, because you know, in, the, in recent events, he has backed the at least the nationalist elements. We know they are a minority in Taxi Square, and he has backed the military's role um, in Egypt. And I guess what has been the response of the revolution inside Syria to him, you know, posing in that way? And um, you know, also you know, I read in the Guardian yesterday about the murder of the FSA leader by the jihadis, and, and what ramifications that might have as well. طيب بالنسبة للسيد الذي تحدث عن روزا لوكسمبورغ في الواقع أكيد روزا لوكسمبورغ تتقلب في قلب في قبلنا مما سمعته من هذا السيد الذي لا علاقة له بالثورة. I'd like to reply to the gentleman who raised this question about that you can't uh, dirty the name of Rosa Luxemburg by associating her with our revolution. The problem that the uh, Syrian revolution is facing is that the imperialist countries and the imperialist, the imperialist powers are saying that they do support the Syrian people. But the Syrian people don't want these kind of friends. And they didn't ask for these kind of friends. <laughs> 
يقولون انهم سيلعبون، ماذا قدموا لنا منذ سنتين ونصف؟ بعض اليسار يقول هناك تدخل عسكري امبريالي على سوريا، لم نرى سوى تدخل روسي والايراني وحسب الله عسكريا. And if we're looking at imperialist intervention from outside, some of the, the left are supporting intervention by Russia and Iran through Hezbollah in, militarily into the Syrian. <laughs> These are the bullets that are killing us, comrades. These are the bullets that are killing our revolution. Where are the British troops, the American troops? Where are their weapons? القوى التي تدعي صداقتها للشعب السوري مزعورة من الثورة السورية. As, the, as one of the comrades was saying, the, the forces that are supporting, pretending to support the revolution are the ones that are trying to destroy it. And the, uh, uh, we see, for example, Clinton wants a transitional discussion and a, and a, and a, and a debate in, in order to save the regime. بمعنى البقاء على هذا النظام بشكل وباخر وادخال عناصر من المعارضه السوريه في الخارج به فقط هذا ما يريدونه كمساعده للشعب السوري في الوقت الذي تدمر فيه طاقاته وجماهيره وافضل عناصره وشبابه هذا الشعب. What Clinton wants to see is something that will bring in the remnants of the old regime together with the Syrian opposition that's in exile in order, to, in order to come to some kind of compromise and save, and save the system. At the same time as the Syrian people, the Syrian masses are fighting on the ground uh, to complete their revolution. لماذا بقي حتى الآن؟ لماذا صمد حتى الآن؟ سؤال آخر. لأن الشعب السوري لديه بين قوسين أصدقاء من النوع الذي ذكرتهم، وأيضا هذا النظام لديه حلفاء لم يتخلوا عنه كما فعل حلفاء الأنظمة الأخرى. هل نسيتم أن أوباما طلب بعد 15 يوما من كان بن علي في البداية أو لاحقا حسن مبارك أن يرحل؟ and at the same time, we have this incredibly brutal regime that is uh, that's, that's attacking us. Why is it still there? Why is it still in place? Well, we have to look again in terms of these so-called friends of the Syrian revolution. What what are they what are they doing? Ben Ali Obama told him to go, and Hosni Mubarak and, Hos, and Hosni Mubarak as, as well. <laughs> انهم يدعمونه بالمال وبالرجال وبالخبراء وبالسلاح ايران روسيا وحزب الله. And there are supporters, the regime also has allies. The regime has allies who are supporting it financially with experts and militarily. That's Iran and Russia and Hezbollah. ثانيا ان الجيش السوري الرسمي الحكومي للنظام لم يتفكر كما حصل في ليبيا لهذا السبب ما نقول لا توجد حرب اهليه. Another difference why another reason why the regime is still there is that the Syrian army, the uh, official uh, regime's army did not fragment as the Libyan army did. ثانيا البرجوازيه السوريه وهو نظام برجوازي لم تتخلى عن هذا النظام بعضا في الصراع الطبقي شديد الطبقه الحاكمه والملكه تضحي احيانا بجزء منها حفاظا على مصالح التاريخيه، البرجوازيه السوريه الكبرى لم تتخلى ولا تريد ان تضحي حتى الان بهذا العصابه الحاكمه. Another reason is that the Syrian bourgeoisie has not abandoned the regime yet. The Syrian bourgeoisie is prepared to see the, the, the see massacres continue and it, it still it still believes that it, its best interests are served by uh, keeping hold of the regime in the midst of this violent class struggle. 
For this reason, the Syrian revolution is extremely important because the popular Syrian revolution is not only confronting a, di a bourgeois dictatorship um, and it, it, is, it is fighting it, but it's also confronting imperialism both from the West and from the East. العمال الكادحين الذين هم قلب هذه الثورة ويواجهون كل هذه التحديات لا يمكن إلا أن تكون لديهم قناعة عظيمة بالنصر هذه القناعة نحن تتلبسنا. Um, it's, the, it's workers and uh, ordinary working people who are at the heart of this of this revolution and they have no other means to fight back like this. وإنها لثورة دائمة. And that's why it's a permanent revolution. Uh, I'd like to thank you, thank you all. It's, uh, well, I was just to say this, this may seem like a little bit of a tense meeting, but just to tell you, the last meeting was me and, and, and Joseph Daher were over in Tunisia at the International uh, you know, at the Social Forum. And um, we didn't just get interrupted, we had like something like 100 Ba'athists come and smash us up and beat us chase us around. So, you know, you get used to this. <laughs> That's okay. I'd also, I'd also like to say that I don't think it's right for the Western left to make people from the third world present their credentials to them over their revolution. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. 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 you know, the country, you know, I'm Lebanese, and the reason why I'm in this country is because of the war and, and the way we were exiled. Exile. People you know, come up to you and go and warn you about Israel. Like, thank you. Like, as if you don't know what Israel will do. Like, we don't know what, that, that we face enemies in the US, that Saudi Arabia is a reactionary. Thank you. We didn't realize Saudi Arabia was a reactionary for the last 40 years. We know all of this. We do know all of this. And the, but our trouble is, is that we have nothing. That we start from nothing and we have enemies everywhere. So what do we do? And they say to us, shut up. Shut up. Stay back where you were. I'll tell you, 30 years since I was political, uh, since I started becoming political, it's the same story. They say we're going to raise the question of, the, of, of, of women's rights. Shh. Israel. We want to raise the question of, of strikes. We make strikes to help Israel. This is something we've heard over and over again. And actually, to be honest with you, I'm kind of re re relieved that, pe that the Western left are now beginning to hear this because we've had this rhetoric for 30 years. Yeah. Shut up, shut up, shut up. No, we bloody won't. Yeah. There is a revolution. <laughs> and, and there is an Arab saying, there is a saying in the Arab world, is that every man has to at some point stand naked in the desert before God. And this, I think, expresses most the ideas that we've had, that, that we've had to live with in the, in the Arab world. They've all been stripped naked and they've all been found wanting. Because none of the, 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 the ideas, the Stalinist ideas, to be honest, Hezbollah, the Islamist ideas, none of these are fitting the situation of the people and what the people want. And I think uh, 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 not only the Islamists discovering this, but also the Muslim Brotherhood are discovering this, which is these revolutions were not about putting them into power. These revolutions were about something much bigger than that. It's just that we have been, the left has been so weak and have this long shadow over us, not just the recognition of the state of Israel by the Soviet Union, but also the terrible policies and, and ideas that, that went after us, hangs over us and actually makes the, 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 the revolutionary left, we start from nothing. And in Lebanon, the whole of the revolutionary left was wiped out. And in Syria, the whole of the revolutionary left was wiped out. So we start from nothing. But what is it we have? We have a popular uprising of the people with all its difficulties face to all this kind of enemies, and we say, and I think it goes to your heart that says, when you, when you don't see the oppressed, and you don't say, I stand with the oppressed. First I stand with the oppressed, and then I try and understand their struggle. If you do not do that, then you can't be a socialist. And to be honest, we say, let me you right now with this list, you must be against this and this and this before we will give you, no, I'm sorry, that doesn't work that way. I want to become, oh, I'm sorry, I'm expressing my anger now. <laughs> Um, you know, obviously warn you about the role of Saudi Arabia and Qatar because people don't know that it's reaction. I just want to come to the question, two, two questions. One was the question of Hezbollah. Because um, uh, uh, it, it, it's one that affects us directly in Lebanon and it's one I think that people have to understand. And I'm going to I'll just take a few minutes to try and explain. In 2006, from 2000 to 2006, Hezbollah was seen very much, was very much the bulwark, the organization that defended the south of Lebanon against the Israelis. And the reason why Hezbollah was so important was because there was nothing anywhere else. They were able to do it, and they had full support. In 2006, when, Hezbollah, when the Israelis attacked Lebanon, Hezbollah, Hezbollah were able to move the entire Shia population, almost the entire Shia population from South Beirut and Southern Lebanon 
into Christian areas of northern Lebanon and into places and cities like Pomps and Hamma and Damascus. These are where they went. So when the Israelis came to demolish southern Beirut, there was no one there. Why? Because they were sitting in the homes of the poor people in Homs and Hamma and so on. I tell you, since 2006, right after the victory, I remember the, the, we put out a warning. Hezbollah has two ways to go, he said. It can either build on the fact that it's seen as a national movement and break out of its Sarek's uh, narrow sectarian base, or it can begin to play the sectarian game in Lebanon. Unfortunately, it began to play the sectarian game in Lebanon. And instead of attempting to say, we're against totally the sectarian system in Lebanon, he said, we want a bigger part of the sectarian system in Lebanon. And he began to see inside of the areas, especially the reconstruction, the, uh, the, the, the rise of a Shia middle class that were buying up those apartments uh, and those, those, place, those plots that were demolished by the Israelis at a cheap price and selling them on. So now some of the most expensive areas in Lebanon were the slums of southern Beirut. And so they're driving out the vast majority, quite a lot, of very poor Shia people whose sons are now being taken to fight a revolution in Syria. And you may think that the, the, the Shia people are somehow stupid. Well, I'll tell you they're not, because I'll speak to our comrades in Lebanon and you get the same story, because the majority of them are Shia. And they've had to flee their areas and have to find refuge in other areas, and you get the same thing. One of our comrades, uh, 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 neighbor, her son died in Qusair, in the Battle of Qusair. And the neighbors had to restrain his mother because she was screaming, why, why is it my son who signed up to fight the Israelis is being killed and killing Syrians? There is a huge rage that is developing amongst these people, especially in the families in the south who raised a petition against Hassan Nasrallah and, 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 and Hezbollah and said, why are you demolishing the homes of the people who gave us refuge in 2006? And so doing, in so doing, Hezbollah has now become, I hate to say this, it's a horrible thing to say, it hurts. Hezbollah has now become a sectarian party and thinking like a sectarian party. And of course, every man has to stand naked in the desert before God. It's ideas, the Islamist ideas appeared in that vacuum after the defeat of the left, but they cannot, they cannot provide a, 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 a solution. And you saw, and people say they had no choice. I'm sorry, they did have a choice. Absolutely had a choice, because Hamas went the other way. Hamas said, we don't have anything to do with this. And people may say, Hezbollah are in a worse situation than Hamas. I'm sorry. Hamas, the Palestinians, are in the weakest situation in the Arab world. It was just a pressure amongst Palestinians that said, we do not want to be part of the bloody suppression of a popular uprising, and Hamas followed suit. And you see now this split. And I think Hezbollah took the wrong turn, and now they're going to pay for it. Because I tell you what, I take no joy in saying this. If the Israelis come again, which they probably will do, I fear the Shia people of Southern Lebanon will have now no friends. And this is a big defeat for us. And so you get the sense in which the limits of Islamist ideas, the limits of sectarian ideas, actually weakens our side. Now, having said that, of course, we live in an age of revolution, so let's not forget to the press. We just had 17 million you know, Egyptians come on the street. I keep reminding people, 17 million Egyptians. Uh, wouldn't it be nice if we had 17 million on the streets here? Please, stick it on Facebook, let's see if it works. Uh, but first to say that, just, you know, just to say that we talk about permanent revolution, we talk about uh, 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 starting from, 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 from nothing, really, in, in, inside Syria. And we really have to start from nothing. But the speed in which I think the development of ideas has really taken us by, you know, just taking my breath away. The discovery that there were, Gayat uh, uh, and his people had been secretly working and reading inside of Syria underneath of this was, of course, a big surprise to me. Oh, there are Syrian revolutionaries, and they are there, and there are, we do have comrades inside of both the occupied areas and the liberated areas working as hard as we can to try and, you know, build the influence of the left, and also look and say, point, that's really nice, isn't it? Say, you know, how are we going to do this? You point to Egypt. See, the Egyptians, see, how, see, see what they do? We should do the same. So there is, if, if, if you like, this tremendous, this tremendous uh, 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 spirit, I think, uh, about the revolution, but it's very delicate. It's extraordinarily delicate, and it faces so many enemies. So let's not, you know, to, to stand up here and insult it. Let's try and understand we begin. We, we begin from that, and, and not assume people don't know that there's dangers everywhere. Of course, of, of course there are. And I find out just to, to, to say just simply on the question of the Kurdish, on the Kurdish, because this is a very important question inside of this, and uh, uh, and one that comes up constantly. Um, I think there's a very simple formula, which is this: the Kurdish people inside of Syria have faced historically, and also the rest of the Arab world, uh, national oppression. Therefore, when the revolution broke out 
And the question of whether the Kurds should be allowed to have to, to secede from Syria, a regime that gave you know a country in that sense that gave them nothing, the Syrian National Council said absolutely no way. The Kurds will be once again subjected to the Syrians. Of course you're gonna lose them. Of course you're gonna lose them. So we have to say, I think the appeal to the the, 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 uh, 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 the Kurdish sections of, of, of the Syrian population is we want you to be part of Syria. Actually, I'd quite like Lebanon to be part of Syria again, that'd be really nice, and Palestine and so on. But uh, yeah. uh, we want you to be part of that, but we understand that if you want to go alone, you go alone. And I think, as I say, that the secret to a good marriage is the right to divorce. And I think we have to, and we have to offer that to them. Because to be honest with you, who the hell wants to be part of that Kurdish regime of northern Iraq or really any, any of the other? So it is, I think, part of that national liberation movement inside the revolution. The revolutionaries have to be side on the side of the national liberation movement. Because if they're not, then you start getting them saying, well, we have, we see, you know, uh, uh, no way we can be either with the regime or we could be uh, with the revolution. There's no difference. We have to say you're part of the revolution. And part of that is an understanding of how you suffered under the uh, under the uh, 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 under the previous uh, under the previous regime. Again, thank you very much, and, and thank you. I'd like to thank the Bathists for not coming this time. <laughs> <laughs>